I want to let you know that thinking is a natural thing among us. And there were years when we were more intelligent before farmers, bakers, and fools interfered with our way of life. When we had professional thinkers, his job was just to think. You brought him his shoes, his sandals, his food. His job was to think for the people. And when you needed a problem solved, you came to him. His maintenance and respect was his salary. We lost this and became literal prostitutes to the values or the lack of values of the foreigners and the fakers and the fools. This is why we have imprisoned our mind by not accepting Africa's greatest <coughs> contribution <coughs> and not learning what made Egypt great and what made Ethiopia great. It's a simple thing and yet it's a complicated thing. They became great because they had collective discipline and high morality. And for most of their existence, they had no word for jail because no one had ever gone to one. Now you see the damage of the foreigners and the fakers and the fools. And once you read Sheikh Antadiop's work, and understand the nature of African societies before this interference, you will understand the nature of his great contribution. Then you have to go back and see the basis of our thinking and where somewhere in the march of life we reached a fork in the road and turned in the wrong direction. We lost of a concept of African values. We lost track of the great 19th century African mentality. The, in Africa in the 19th century, when slavery was being transformed from that crude system into a more sophisticated system called colonialism, uh, still another form of slavery. Africans presented resistance throughout that whole continent, throughout this whole century. And Winston Churchill has said, these Africans who never heard of a military school I wore a short store-bought shoe out general some of the finest minds of Europe. Why you do not know anything about them is the fact that your mind has been so imprisoned by both colonialism and its aftermath and its propaganda that you dare to look at yourself as a collective hero you dare to look at your own warriors. You dare go into that 19th century in the United States and examine the thinking. Martin Delaney, a great Jamaican, Robert Campbell, who went out to Nigeria, Abakuta, to search for a place with Martin Delaney. You dare to look at the work of our, the non-fiction work of the first black novelist, William Wells Brown, the female anti-slavery speakers, Elaine Watkins, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner True. You dare to look at the finest single mind produced in the United States by black Americans in the 19th century, Frederick Douglass, 
a look at his conflict with Ruswam and others over whether to settle in Liberia or not to settle. Douglas took a principled position that was right and his opposition was also right. Too many times you've been trained by the movies to look for the good guy and the bad guy in the drama. When sometimes you got dramas with all bad guys, you got dramas with all good guys. You don't necessarily have to have a bad guy. Douglas was not a bad guy because he opposed the African migration movement. He said that we had earned our right to stay in this country with our blood and our sweat and our death. And he was right. Delaney and others, Campbell, Ruswan, said that the opening up of Liberia, the settlement of Liberia, gives us an opportunity to prove to the world we once ruled great states and could do it again. And they were right. So we're not dealing with right or wrong here. We deal with two rights in conflict. And your American movie mind won't let you deal with two rights in conflict because you still haven't dealt with the two rights in conflict in relationship to W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington where both of them were right then, both of them were right now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We did not need to devise that Booker T. Washington or W.E.B. E. B. Du Bois. We needed Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. Both of them had something to contribute to our own salvation as a people. Then you need to look at the end of that 19th century when Africans began to send forth great thinkers. You need to look at the life of Edmund Blyton and look at his inaugural address on liberal education Liberia College, 1881. And we look at the Caribbean thinkers, Blyden, others that followed Blyden. Blyden was from the Danish West Indies at the, at the time. And understand that great thinking, great challenges, opening up questions not new to us, I acknowledge Sheikh Antadio as the finest single mind produced in Africa in the 20th century. He came from a great antecedence. He came from a line of Africans who gave the world the concept of the oneness of God. and never use the word God. The word God is un-African. It's another lecture. <laughs> Organized religion is un-African. Still another lecture. You think you can't do without this hogwash brought by Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And it is hogwash. <laughs> Spiritual man is worse because of it. Man's spirituality was never supposed to be organized into something called religions, but don't get me on that because I'm 80 years old, I don't run very fast, and I don't know where the door is. Because <laughs> I think most black people are ex-Baptists who got lost on their way home anyway. <laughs> I first heard of the works of Sheikh Atadio at the first World African Writers Conference. I'm coming home from my first extended trip to Africa, 1958. Sheikh Atadio has participated in that first Congress and the proceedings are in Paris. 
Also in Paris was Rene Moran, an African who was once the governor of French Equatorial Africa and who wrote a, uh, a novel, 1922, that won the equivalent of the Nobel, the Pulitzer Prize. He was alive then. He would die all three, four years later. I would not meet Sheikh Antadiop then, but read an essay he had written called The Fundamental Levels of History. I would become interested in his work, interested in the debate over his PhD thesis. I would gather as many of his works as I could while I was in Paris, go home, and later, before I'd even met him, compiled 20 most important books on African history written by Africans themselves. The, one of the books that he wrote for a PhD thesis that was turned down was in that uh, collection. Around oh, 67 or thereabout, the first right, the, the second Congress of Africans were held, was held in Dakar. They had second rate white participants. Some of the black participants weren't the best they could have chosen. Shekhar Diop's laboratory was 300 yards from the hall where the, the lecture was being held. And he wasn't invited. And his, his work had already contradicted the works of some of the white writers. Bubahama, Niger was alive then. And finally, he became chairman of one of the panels and began to invite the African speakers to the podium. And we played a game of using, if you're going to allow me five minutes, I'll speak three minutes or four minutes to say that uh, that is not all I have to say, but I will relinquish my time to my distinguished colleague and name another black speaker. <laughs> so they had nothing but black speakers, one after the other, all evening, because none of them would yield the floor. <laughs> and we took over the car, and <laughs> we took it over. About the second day, one of the persons who had been secretary to Catherine Dunham, Jeanette Stovall, who was re translating the French into English. And I don't speak French very well, but when you mispronounce it, misinterpret it, I can catch it. You know, because I know the sounds well enough. As I said, Jeanette, do you really translate all that garbage? He said, no, no, man, man. When they say garbage in French, I translate it in English and leave out the garbage. <laughs> I said, could you, during your lunch hour, take me over to see Sheik at a deal? We walked to his laboratory and I greeted him. I had corresponded with him and he was happy. Then he sat me down and told me he had several books that I had not read. And he gave it to me. He gave me these books and his son over to pick up the books. And that began our friendship. I came back to America determined to bring his books to the attention of a black audience in America. It took me seven years, 
And finally, a publisher that had made quite a bit of money on one of my books that I objected to, not because of anything other than the title. It's called American Negro Short Stories. I said, I object to the word Negro being a title in any book I wrote or edited. He said, well, you did. You did sign the contract without noticing this, and you're bound by the contract. He said, but this is a more commercial title, and you're going to laugh all the way to the bank. <laughs> For the next four years, I made approximately $7,000 a year on that single book. I made, made well over $50,000 on the book before it began to slow down. Then I revised it and brought it out again on the title that I wanted, Black American short stories, a century of the best. But the important thing here is that one of the partners, Hill and Wing, broke, went from his own company. I figured they'd made enough money on me and they owed me one. So I pressed Hill, see if he would publish one of Sheck's books. And he wasn't in a position to say no. He didn't know which one he wanted to publish. When I took it up with Chef, Chef said, well, I'm dissatisfied with this. I, just, I got to rewrite this. I got to do this. So what Chef did was to take the best chapters from his already published books and to make a separate book, separate bibliography. Cool. African origins of civilization, myth or reality. The book sold well in the African American community and it is still selling. Mercer Cook, who had been ambassador to Senegal, translated, who, who, who taught French at Howard, and who was a friend of Shea, did an excellent trans translation. And the book became popular now. Hill now would publish Black Africa, The Politics of a Federated State. That little book was and still is a monumental message that Africans still miss. Otherwise, Africa would, would be dominated by the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. And Africa would not be recolonialized as it is. There's not a true independent state in Africa. Africa's not even ruled by Africans, ruled by Africans with African bodies and European minds and sometimes European wives. But in this little book, and you do well to read it well, because he wrote this book at a time measured against now is one of the finest pieces of prophecy about Africa that Africans still don't appreciate. He said the river banks of Africa, now the Niger, the Limpopo, the Congo, can raise enough food to feed Africa and Europe. That Africa was the pride they wanted to conquer. If they don't conquer, they want to disrupt it to the point where the African would turn inward on himself. And that has already happened. To the point where people are now writing articles advocating European recolonization of Africa. Because the African, miseducated in the West, fighting over the crumbs of power, has turned on the African. You don't have an African head of state in Africa with being called leader. Not one, nobody, not even among the Arabs, another bunch of 
colonial parasites, but that's another lecture too. And I need some protection from a whole lot of people if I deliver that, especially Ellen Madison Road. I need protection from the Muslims who talk a lot about something they don't know a damn thing about. I never met a, I met a, I met Muslim scholars. Scholars who were Muslim, but not, not scholars who were scholarship on the religion because nearly all the religions in Africa were imposed on Africa by conquerors. There's nothing sacred about any of it. And African belief systems, indigenous, was good enough. Now, I don't want to prolong this too much because I want some dialogue. Because you'd have no dialogue with the students or the audience you haven't said anything anyway. I want you to dare to doubt, dare to challenge, dare to say, I don't believe that. Because most of my life I've been a teacher and I know one thing, you have to open up your mind to say, I don't believe that. And once you open up your mind, I'll put something in it you can't take out. <laughs> We have to look at this book. We have to look at William Leo Hansberry's work, Africa World's Richest Continent. Africa from the point of view of rainfall, from the point of view of hydroelectric potential, has the greatest potential of any continent in the world. Any one part of Africa got 10 times more than the Japanese started with. Why can't they put it together? They cannot remember or remind themselves of that. Powerful people never educate powerless people on the technique they use to be used to take the power away from the previous power. So they disrupt, they set Africa up to fall apart. The tragedy in Uganda was not African, it was French. The tragedy in the Congo is Belgium, American, French and English. British propaganda would make German propaganda under Hitler look like a Sunday school lesson. They're so effective. 30 years after they have left the Caribbean island, Caribbean people are still divided among themselves on color lines, class lines, the same line the British is still in their minds. And still thinking of England as a motherland. When they go there, the British tells them something different when they go there to live. But the Sheikh Antidope is more significant. And I want to point out the importance of another word, the cultural unity of black Africa. His section, which is take about one third of the book, on the origin of the matrilineal should be compulsory reading. Maybe it's fortunate or unfortunate faith will not ever bless me with dictatorial power. I'd make everybody read a book before they have breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> and the certain people I would execute before they had their breakfast while they're watching me have mine. <laughs> This book should be read especially by misguided black women who are following white women's lib movement. It's not about them at all. They should read what she says about the treatment of women and they should remember it was in Africa that the woman became head of state for the first time in human history. Wrote at the head of her army for the first time in human history. 
and was a god for the first time in human history. All while the woman in Europe was a vassal. And that the greatest respect was paid to the mother. Now you come down here, you debate, and you let a faker lead people to Washington. One of the guys we got to atone. When black women were rising high in the state, they were supported by black men who let them go and encouraged them to go as far as their mind will take them and did not feel one iota of insecurity because of it. The European has made you feel insecure with women because he's insecure with women. We came out of a society where women were not feared, but respected. If you don't know your history, you don't know this. We need to point to the last work published before Sheik died. Civilization or barbarism. Because in this work, Sheik was saying, no more maybe, no more perhaps, this is the story. That is his magnum opus, his final great work that sums up the conclusions of a great career. I'm very pleased to have known him personally over a 20-year period. He was pressured by the government. I used to go to Dekar often. And we would meet in a hotel that used to be the leading hotel in Dekar years ago before they built the big ones, the Quarter Sioux, the Nova Kale, and the other ones. Little hotel called, well, not little, but these Quarter Sioux was, was the hotel before they built the Taringa and all the, all, all the others. And Sheikh would enter from the back. He used to sit in the back beyond the bar. That was kind of a semi-darkened area because he didn't want to get me in trouble by letting the government know that I associated with him. What a tragedy that I had to duck and hide to see him as though I was a married man <clears throat> visiting a mistress. And to some extent, he was a colleague and a friend. He was going to come to America for a Nile Valley conference. Something happened, he didn't come. Something happened, the airplane, and he thought the science wasn't right that a great scientific mind like Sheikh Antadio has some respect for African traditions, science. He grew up in a Muslim dominated community and he had respect for their contribution in language and all, but he was not an endorser of the Arab presence or the Arab slave trade is still going on in Africa. He was an intelligent Marxist in as much he did not re swallow it and regurgitate it. And he was making a reassessment of Marxism and what role it could have had in Africa when he died. It's a pity he didn't finish this reassessment. He was moving politically toward the left, but moving more toward the proper use of African traditional values and African civilization. If I said we killed him by neglect, I would be right. Because we killed Du Bois the same way when the Du Bois lived so much longer. We killed Chancellor Williams the same way. But 
one of the proudest moments of my wandering over the world where African people live was my meeting with Shikanta Dio, my writing an introduction to some of his books published in America, and the fact that the two of us called each other friends. Thank you. beliefs, for lack of a, bad, a better term, um, I use the term animism. Are you advocating a return back to more traditional animistic beliefs? And are you an advocate of pan-Africanism, things that, I mean, a term that I don't hear in the news anymore? I'm an absolute pan-Africanist. I'm an African nationalist. And I'm an African traditionalist to the extent that tradition can be rescued from yesterday to improve today. I don't believe in everything in the past. I believe in editing it to the point of making it use. That was African concepts of brotherhood, African concepts of the family that need to be restored. I don't accept the word animism as used by the Europeans. I don't accept the word primitive as used by the Europeans. I see people need to return to values of their own creation. Every invader of every country, including white invaders of white countries, did more harm than good. And there is nothing to the contrary. We need to get out of our mind the idea that anybody civilized anybody anytime. People don't civilize people. People impose on them their way of life at the expense of destroying the indigenous way of life. I do not recommend the return to animism, whatever you mean by animism. I say there is nothing in African traditionalism that rules out modern medicine, modern roads, extensive study. You have to remember that the first concept of a university, the university, the uh, great lodge at Luxor started in Africa. The first intellectual gatherings of men and women to discuss the affairs of the state started in Africa. And if you are misguided enough to think the world waited in darkness for Europe to bring the light, then I refuse to have pity on you. <laughs> Lay it on. <laughs> I'm curious why Sub-Saharan Africa needs to be validated by Egypt and even Ethiopia. Because I would either evaluate you as a total human being by noticing you have two hands, or I would call you a one-handed man. I mean, why Ethiopia and Egypt? Because you find achievements there that you want to claim for Europe. And if you understand the chronology of European history, these achievements occurred before the first European wore a shoe or lived in a house that had a window. Uh, Dr. Clark, uh, will you speak on uh, after the out-migration uh, from Africa, the predators coming back to Africa? So who, who are you talking about? Go, go ahead. Okay, from the origin, from, from... The Supreme Court could have been your grandfather or your uncle. 
The European did not understand that formation. So what he cannot understand, he will destroy or ridicule because he's insecure in the face of civilization. He did not create and cannot understand. And he must use the word primitive. Just like Marx was silly enough to use the word primitive communism. What the hell are you talking about primitive communism? You had communism and communal societies throughout the world before there was a Europe. The European formulized and dogmatized something thinking it began with them. And there are some pseudo-black scholars coward enough to accept it. I don't belong among them. I have a follow-up. Uh, Dr. Uh, Clark, there's a, a new book out by Dr. Obama, uh, uh, Speak of an African Philosopher in World History. And uh, in that book, he deals with the uh, linguistic factor of the, the connection of different languages throughout Africa from, uh, from the ancient uh, uh, society of Ethiopia, uh, uh, Kemet, all those different societies that had connected and since those languages are connected, it comes to uh, origin that all the people that was uh, uh, that came back to Africa after the out migration, that they came back and they just don't quite get it. It's almost like today, and you see the video of Rodney King or something, somebody getting the hell beat out of them, but they just can't see it with their mind eyes. It's the same problem that's been going on for a few thousand years, and Dr. Obinga goes that in this new book on the lost tradition. I'm, I'm familiar with Dr. Vega's book. In fact, I'm trying to find a proper publishing for it right now. And what, now, if you read Sheikh Antadiop's The Culture, Unity of Africa, and read a book by Father Temple called Bantu Philosophy, you would understand it. He said, if you want to understand the ancient Egyptian thought, Study the Bantu. Now, we know that the, the word Bantu is not African. A European asked an African, what are you? And the African did not understand his language because the European and the African answered, I'm a man, Bantu. And so he wrote down, he has now discovered the Bantu people. <laughs> most numerous, certain physical traits, there's no such thing as a bantu. <laughs> the fool did not, he said, I'm a man. I mean, he said, the European mean, what tribe you belong to? The African he said, what are you? So the African told him what he was. He said, he is a man. Bantu. Man. Mantu, the mood of a man. The European don't try to understand. He's got a sick ego. He tried to pray that the world waited in darkness for him to bring the light. When, when, when are you going to look at the chronology of history? The first glimmer of European intelligence was a piece of folklore called the Odyssey in, in the Iliad. Rome and Greece were not European states. They were Mediterranean African states. There were no European states at the time. And what did the Europeans call, what did the Romans and the Greeks call the Europeans of that day? The Northern Barbarians. How then is it that in Africa, cannot claim Ethiopia and Egypt as part of his heritage. When every Scandinavian schoolboy and all these people whose nation didn't even have a name when there was Roman Greece, came Roman Greece as part of their heritage. He's a lying dog. Roman Greece is not a part of their heritage. It's part of the African Mediterranean heritage. Uh, Dr. Clark, uh, uh, today the uh, Europeans and the European Americans have a powerful system of control set up in Africa. 
economically? It's not over the world. Over oh, the world. Okay, but they got a powerful one. It's not computerized. Right? Okay. <laughs> so now, uh, we're getting ready to go into the 21st century, okay? Now, as, as Africans can't break that control, that stranglehold on Africa, what are we going to do? And if we, how are we going to break that control? Well, I've been advocating it for years and people thought I was out of my mind. We created a great industry in Africa with Africa. See, I was wearing no clothes I don't make. We got we're not buying European clothes anymore. I eat the food my geography produced. Now we're no longer dependent on Europe for food because Africa produced the food. I would buy nothing from Europe that cannot that's not obtainable within Africa itself. Now, Africa got a great internal trade. Now, we participate in a highway system that will connect Africa with Africa. No matter how you cut it, every time you come back to it, you got a pan African nationalist answer, or you've got no answer at all. Mm. <laughs> no, you've got to believe in yourself to do something. We've been programmed into being super consumers, but not super producers. I once said, made this proposal at a meeting for Martin Luther King and said, if he just take off all of his clothes except his underwear and say, I wear no shoes, clothes my people don't make, he could revolutionize our industry. He might understand Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi was a great Indian nationalist. He did not even believe in, he did not even help the Chinese next door who was being kicked around by the, by the Japanese. Mahatma Gandhi had one word to say about it. Went back to India when he, he was a, a brown-skinned Englishman. When all those clothes dead tweeds in the dead summertime and really people got ridiculed him to the point where he went back to basics. Took it all off. Went back to the spinning wheel. That's what we need to do. Go back to basics. We got a lot of pressure that we can pull, pressure levers that we, we can pull on. We're not as helpless as you think we are. I once advocated something else that somebody asked me, wanted to have my mind examined. I still think it's a good idea. Close the continent of Africa down. Nobody comes in, nobody goes out. We're making an inventory. <laughs> when we decide what we can do, how much gold, how much diamonds, we sell nothing that we don't use, we, we don't need by ourselves. We sell the surplus. You could close American industry down the first week. No gold, no diamonds, no manganese, no cobalt. When you understand the mineral wealth of Africa, the, the presently known and the mineral wealth still unknown, you close Africa down for a week and see what happened. But you can't do it arguing among yourself. You can't do it arguing about some damn religions that you didn't create in the first place. You can't do it arguing over Michelangelo's religion who posed for the picture of Christ. The whole concept of the Christ image created the conference of Nicaea number 325 AD now, and the picture was painted in 1500 A.D. Between 325 A.D. And, and, and 1500 A.D., you really had no physical picture of Christ. So who saved you before? <laughs> now, if the Son of God is white, then you assume that God is white. The European not only colonized information about history, he colonized history itself. And he colonized the image of God. What permitted the Japanese to recover from two atomic bombs and defeat? They refused to let their enemy take away from them their God concept. 
refused to let that enemy take away from, take them from the geography of their origin. In Japan, the Buddha is Japanese. In Indonesia, the Buddha is Indonesian. In China, the Buddha is Chinese. In all of your churches, the Christ <laughs> is Michelangelo's relative who posed for the picture. Deal with that. Oh, uh, I just wanted to mention something and uh, ask Dr. Tuck what you think about it. I've been fortunate to work for you for second job for five years for a fraction of level. But when I came to the United States, what I realized is that no one as, a, as, a, as an activist, a political activist, he created three political parties, he went to jail, and that's for that same reason that he's never given a tenure at the university, because Senghor used to say we cannot do it by ourselves, because we need the blood of the, the Europeans, what he called uh, the cornerstone of his theory, the symbiote, the, the, how do you call it, the metisage cultural. We have to have that to be able to think rationally as a black. And the second term he used to say no. As a young activist, we used to challenge him, telling it's too late to go back to Egypt, it's too late to do this. And he says, with all our wealth, as long as we don't have our self-esteem knowing who we are, we'll never be able to use our wealth. So, and I, I, I just heard Dr. Clark saying that if you don't know your, your history, you will not know there. Does anything think that it's useful to help with the, uh, introducing Shekhan again as, a, as an activist, as a politician in Africa? Well, you have to deal with certain physical types produced by colonialism. In this country, you have a bunch of, you know, cowards who wants to be, look, if you want to be like your oppressor so much, you are no value to your people. Now, when you look at Leopold Singer, some of his work I admire, but if he say Africa's emotion Philosophical thought is European. Now I'm off his boat right there. <laughs> because there was no philosophical thought in Europe until the African connection. Books like Stolen Legacy, the last book by um, Obinga. Dr. Ben's work, Black Man of the Nile and the African Origins of the Major Western Religions. Then work written by white writers that whites continue to ignore, such as Gerald Massey's six volume work, Egypt, Light of the World, two volumes, Natural Genesis, two volumes, Book of the Beginning, two volumes. Whites have failed to examine the challenge to the European concept of superiority laid down by Europeans. Not only Massey, but Massey's disciple. That is American disciple, Alvin Boyd Q, who wrote several books what rereading today because not only head of that time, head of this time. One called Who is This King of Glory? And another one, Shot of the Third Century. Another one, The Lost Christianity. And John Jackson's last book, one of the finest books written on the background of Christianity by a black person. Christianity before Christ. It was the concept of Christianity that existed in the world long before someone formalized it and dogmatized it around a character called Jesus Christ. And Europeanized it at the conference at Nicaea. 
move the black images from the church and replace them with white. The crime that has been committed by religion in the name of religion. This is why I have a serious question about the definition of the word religion. I don't know a single form of organized religion that hasn't participated in some form of slavery and servitude to people. Feudalism in Europe was a form of slavery. You can call it anything you want. You can put it up as much as you want. It was a form of slavery. The Arabs were in the slave trade before Islam. They're still in the slave trade. In spite of all the denial, I've got, I'm just stumbling over documents. I took this up with Professor Bernard Lewis, who's an English professor, been at Princeton the last 21 years now, recently retired. And he, um, he mentioned a, a bit of history that I had forgotten and he didn't care too much about. I was in London in the uh, Caribbean community. We went to hold a meeting. They couldn't find a place for the meeting. They realized that Parliament was not in session and holding the House of Parliament. And so we held it in the House of Parliament and I sat in Winston Church's old chair. I wonder if people built a damn empire. You can't make a comfortable chair for the prime minister. <laughs> I was telling Professor Lewis this. He said, there was a man named Chippendale, who was the father of modern great furniture. He was an Englishman. <laughs> so that means we can make a decent chair if we care to make one. The main thing he he, he, he called attention to his works on the Arabs and the slave trade, and, and he sent me uh, debates from the House of Lords, 1960, on slavery in Africa and the and Arabia. Well, somebody to deny that the Arabs and Islam have not been in the slave trade, is to deny all those documents that I'm stumbling over in my study, getting new ones every day, picked up a PhD thesis by a uh, uh, person from the Sudan, Dr. Lane, on slavery in the Sudan. I know a pro-Arab Sudanese who speak good Arabic and was editor of the Sudan rap notes and records. He's pro-Arabic, yet when he wrote his PhD thesis, he wrote a leading chapter on slavery in the Sudan. I read a, a book called um, Nubia, Corridor to Africa. And there's some information on the Bok Treaty less than 20 years after the Arabs entered Africa. They imposed a treaty on the Sudan in which the Sudan had to deliver 360 slaves a year. And they declared war and they couldn't. For somebody to say there's been no slave in the Sudan is, is beyond me. And I, I don't even argue. And I could give them a list of my documents. But I, this is far afield from the que question, but it, it needs to be said that if you teach for a living, You've got to be acquainted with information that proves your point. You cannot be ridiculous in the classroom, not even a little while, especially if you're black. Because whites in the classroom proclaim all things they can't prove, but after all, they control the power structures, the promotion structure, everything else, you know. I wrote an article called The Myth of Black Antisemitism, and I proved my point, proved it well. And all these organizations asked that I be fired. The president said it was academic freedom. And besides, I've got all my documents together, and so why not argue with his documents? They kept arguing here and there, and they couldn't disprove a single thing I said because most of the documents came from them. Including <laughs> Jewish documents, Jewish scholars. Finally, I come up with 
after three years, you're supposed to wait five years to be considered for promotion at the time, to be promoted for full professor in tenure. The committee was 100% Jewish. I got it on the first ballot, ballot you know. But well, they might have hated my guts. They knew one damn thing. If they turn me down for tenure, they have a hard time putting lesser professors up for tenure without explaining why they turned me down. That's far field for me saying we'll take another question. From the ladies, if you don't mind, I, <laughs> that question is generally sharp. From the ladies? They've been a little too solid tonight. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Lewis. Thanks, uh, Dr. Clark, uh, for this uh, lecture on uh, Dr. Second Joke. Uh, I like to express my feelings, my my emotions, as a follower of Dr. Second Joke from 1976, he's still there in Senegal. Mm -hmm. And I am very proud to meet um, former uh, friends who used to be in the same political party, which is Dr. Job, sitting here, his brother, sitting here, Dan Babu, um, there is another brother there. Um, I'm very glad that this is an occasion that uh, we are convening here tonight, uh, celebrating uh, the 10th uh, anniversary of the death of African thinker, our leader, mm -hmm. Mr. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to contribute, uh, if you don't mind, uh, about his contribution uh, during this uh, uh, cultural uh, uh, destruction in uh, Africa and uh, uh, African descent around the world. Uh, Dr. Job was very concerned about the uh, colonial system, you know, the system, uh, colonialism was deeply uh, oriented in colonizing the mind of Africans. Good. That was their main process. And Dr. Job was a very good technician in restoring African culture into African community, uh, trying to build this there, and especially in Senegal. Dr. Job said, uh, we have to teach uh, Senegalese the uh, Senegalese language. That's the first step. You, you know that about 10% of the population only in Senegal are educated. Only 10% of the population went to school. The Europeans took only, I mean, uh, they set up their schools and only allow 10% of the population to be able to attend. I'm not Right. So 90% of the population were out. So how come out of 10% of the population uh, who are going to be the leaders, because those are the people who know how to read, how to write, how to speak French. So obviously, learning the French system, they they, are, they were allowed, and they are still allowed, to work in the system, which is set by France, even though they say that the country is independent. So where is independence in that situation? Well, there, there is no independence. There is no independence. Is something you make yourself. So Dr. Job said, we have to learn African language and set up uh, and do a high research, intensive research, to help Africans learn their own language, to be able to restore the culture, in, you know, in, in, the, in the African community. That was a major contribution to me because, uh, um, I mean, besides his scientific contribution, but considering the cultural aspect, I was very amazed about it because during all my schooling in Africa, I had difficulties like any Africans who went to school in the French system, we had difficulties communicating with our own uh, community, even with our own parents, because the system could make us 
there are nothing but foreigners in our own country. So uh, thanks to Dr. Joe for that. Uh, in responding to a brother who just uh, uh, asked about uh, the 21st century, uh, that's my concern too. Uh, I have been meetings with, uh, I have been having meetings with a lot of uh, friends, uh, brothers and sisters about it. And uh, I believe that for us to be able to face the 21st century, which is not far, in four years, uh, we have to be entrepreneur. We have to think of entrepreneurship, uh, try to create something, invest, put money together, and try to develop it as much as we can and work with the continent. That's very important. Uh, the continent is very rich, broad of potentiality, and I believe that any humankind should start with his community to be able to get up and uh, do something. And uh, that's why I'm inviting uh, everyone, everybody, to, to develop entrepreneurship, especially these days uh, when we have cut off all of them. And we are the first people to be gone. Federal is cutting off, city, uh, municipal, you know, everybody is cutting off. Private companies are cutting off. If we don't have companies and get laid off, uh, what we going to be homeless. And uh, we have to be producers and consumers to be able to, to make it. That was my I'm familiar with Sheikh Hashfield's work on linguistics, and that work has not been translated into English yet. And I have, that was one of the books he gave me uh, our first meeting at his uh, laboratory. That's Sheikh has at least five books that haven't been translated into English. And I believe in the restoration of not only African language, but the total restoration of African cultures and, and customs. And we've lost too much that belonged to us. I can remember that <clears throat> my father grabbed me by the ear and drug me home and gave me the beating of my life. And I kept asking, what was it for? And he said, you passed by that old lady and didn't say, excuse me, and had not even said, good morning? Disrespect to old people in this family is not a negotiable item. You do not get punished the second time. You get punished the first time. Now, we came to this country with some great respect for old people. You can measure the culture and the civilization of a people by what extent they are civil to the very old, the very young, the sick, and the needy. In spite of slavery, we had not lost that. And yet, in the civil rights movement, in the aftermath of the civil rights movement, when we used the wrong phraseology, we was asking for the wrong thing, we should never ask for integration, we should ask for desegregation and justice. But the NACP got us into a syndrome. We didn't get out of it. We kept trying to be most unlike ourselves. And as Blyden said in his inaugural address, Liberia College, 1881, we feed grist into other people's mills. And nothing comes out except what has been put in. Okay, so last question is... Okay, I have one quick question. Um, you mentioned earlier that it's important possibly for Africa to close the store, to take inventory. Um, a lot of people in the classroom and the school is dedicated to developing agents to development, developmental agents. Um, and across the board, it seems like on all indices of development, how it's measured, Africa has flipped. And it has flipped for the last 30 years. Do you see a, or would you advocate a pulling out, pulling out of developmental organizations? No. 
Africa is not being developed for Africa's sake. Africa is being developed to, to accommodate corporations Ameri and American capitalism. And Africa is being developed by African puppets who bought and paid for. What I'm saying would still be valuable. Still, close the damn door down and take an inventory of yourself. Now, during the years when America was alleged to boycott in China, they had almost a 20-year period when they weren't recognized in the United Nations. They weren't recognized in the diplomatic service of the world. But during that 20 years, the Japanese, the Chinese, got them with the Chinese and pulled themselves together. When they finally came out from behind that closed door, they had some strength. That was more than tantamount to world power. It was world power. Think about it. Think about it. What were they doing that 20 years? <laughs> Africa need to think up, think about it. Pull off the, some of the European clothes. African clothes are cheaper and more comfortable too. <laughs> and they need to understand something else that might offend you. That to be a real African committed to the glory and the respect of Africa, your choice of a wife should be an African woman. And this can rub your feelings the wrong way if you want to. But the Japanese for three generations sent their children to all the schools of the world. They mastered enough technology until 1905, the Russians started messing with them and they had a butt kicking contest and the Japanese won the contest. Of all the things the Japanese brought home, there's no record of a single Japanese bringing home a non-Japanese wife. Think about it.